Thank you very much. Uh, this is the information about me. And there are business cards here that have the same information. If you're a print person and you like to take one of those, uh, whenever I give these kinds of conversations, uh, I like to think that I'm available to you, uh, not only here for Q&A, but uh, afterward. And uh, I've hit a slide. And um, why the slide is not showing up, I don't know. That one shows up. All right. Um, what the slide should say, if, <clears throat> if you're really good, you can see it there. Um, it's no wonder how complicated things get what with one thing leading to another. Uh, and that's what's happened to this space. And that's why our life in this space, I'm not going to show you a lot of slides, but it resembles a Mobius strip. I'm writing a novel right now. The hero is uh, an intelligence professional named Mobius because he knows that down whatever path you go, you wind up on the same road coming back to yourself. And the conversation with yourself is the uh, most important one. This is going to happen throughout. Uh, what is going to happen is every time I touch the iPad, you will get a slide that is irrelevant to what I'm saying. Uh, that's happened in a lot of um, presentations because of the way the iPad responds. It's very responsive. Uh, but the Mobius strip is going to remain on the screen for a while because this is what we're talking about. Uh, I, I was asked to do this in part because I've been part of this conference for many, many years. I think this is my uh, seventh time speaking in Amsterdam, uh, and, and most of those times have been for uh, GovCert, uh, for here, for um, DEF CON Europe, and, and the like. And so I've known the players in this field for some time. And Jeff Moss, who founded DEF CON, told me, uh, he says, you know, 20 years ago, when we started this, when DEF CON got underway, if you worked for the man, you were a loser. And then 10 years ago, he said, after professionalization of this space, you know, if you don't work for the man, you're a loser. And then when Jeff sold Black Hat for many millions of dollars and became appointed uh, frequently to boards all over the world, I could say to him, and now you are the man. And that's what's happened in this space. And so if you hang around and observe what's really happening, uh, you become uh, an example of what James Baldwin said, the price one pays for pursuing any profession or calling is an intimate knowledge of its ugly or dark side. Uh, another way of saying that is as it's institutionalized and professionalized, you remember what Timothy Leary said, the apostle of LSD once upon a time, I guess many of you are too young to remember Timothy Leary, but he was. Uh, and he said, you never get the truth from the company memo. And what he meant is, what I've confirmed when I go into a company to do a talk for them or consul consultation, is if you ask the higher ranking people what is going on there, you never get the complete truth because they have been assimilated into the culture, into the society, the organization, into the structure. And it's kind of like the invasion of the body snatchers that when they open their mouth, it looks like someone you used to know, but what comes out is an alien sound because they have been transformed by that assimilation. Well, uh, that's what happens in this space as well. You never get the truth from a company memo, so I ask the people who are lower down, what is it like to work here? And you find out everything. Because when you haven't been assimilated and replaced your own way of constructing reality with that of the organization, uh, you'll tell the truth. So, once upon a time, there was a famous cartoon showed a dog on a high wire, a uh, far side cartoon. Any of you remember the far side? Anybody born uh, before the 80s? Two. Okay, I, a lot of explanation of my references then. Far side, Gary Larson, great cartoon. You can buy them in a bookstore. And they're very, very amusing. And he had a dog up on a high wire, and the dog was trying to balance and walk across from one platform to another. And below the dog in the circus were circles of faces, everyone looking up. And the caption was something like, high above the crowd, Rex tried to remain focused, but he was an old dog. And this was a new trick. Uh, my suggestion is, truthfully, the younger you are and the less you remember the history, the more what I'm going to describe to you may be a new trick 
in terms of the grasping thereof. In other words, to understand where we have really come from and what has happened to the space that you and your colleagues and cohorts, what we have all created, it's not what we thought we were creating back in the day. So I'm going to give you a historical point of reference and then follow through the work I've done for 25 years with the security space, with professional intelligence people, uh, and, and simply paying attention. Uh, how many of you know who Perry Barlow is? Okay, one person knows who Perry Barlow is. How many of you know who the Grateful Dead are? Okay, we're getting closer. Who was the best lyricist for the Grateful Dead? Perry Barlow. Who was he also? He was an apostle of cyberspace. I know that word has gone out of fashion, but back in the day, cyberspace was a new word. It was uh, coined by William Gibson in Neuromancer, uh, a fictional account of a hardcore hacker to which I will return later for another reason. This is what Perry Barlow wrote, and what I want you to understand is that this is what people really believed when cyberspace became available. The first time we put our, ourselves into a website, which was a brand new thing. Uh, I had an early website, and USA Today highlighted it as one of the websites of the week. That's how few there were. And the website was a brand new thing, and when you clicked on something, I remember the first teacher to put... Uh, dissecting a frog in layers of information and visuals, you were in awe because it was a breakthrough into a whole new way of constructing reality, which has become habitual now. We used to talk about going on the Internet. Today you are not going on the Internet any more than you're going on the power grid when you turn on a light. You are, but you don't know it. You turn on the light, you plug in a toaster, you use an appliance but you don't think of the power grid that makes it possible. In my day, you went on the Internet in the same way that my mother would once say to me when I was young, shush, I'm on long distance. There is no such thing as long distance calling because distance has disappeared. And the Internet has transformed the ability to get lost, which used to be a mainstay of mythical adventure, because no one can get lost anymore, and we live inside a panoptic space uh, which is observable. Well, this is what Perry Barlow said. He said, Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you who live in the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. This is from a Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace and a rebuttal to the government of any outside force, especially in the United States, interfering with our freedom online without the consent of the government. And therefore, he said, you have no right to apply any laws to the Internet. That was only 20 years ago. And people believed that wild LSD dream because it seemed like we were entering a new space, a hierarchical structure of abstraction that was somehow separate from the world from which it emerged. But of course it wasn't. Of course it wasn't. So hacktivism evolved as well. Uh, we were going to keep ourselves anonymous on the web. We were going to use anonymizers. Uh, we we're going to use Tor. We we're going to not know that the anonymizers were created in part by the intelligence agencies that wanted us to believe we were anonymous or the obvious that anyone who wanted to be anonymous was someone who needed to be tracked. Just like anyone who uses encryption is someone who's trying to hide something and becomes a much more immediate target. The same is true of Tor. Uh, it, these these uh, mechanisms don't enable you to operate in a trusted way. Because trust is not transitive on the Internet. A, trust B, B, trust C. That doesn't work. You don't know, and you know you don't know uh, who you're talking to. What is trust? I go back to Lyndon Johnson. How many of you remember Lyndon Johnson? Uh, okay, my wife. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Thank you for sitting up front. Lyndon Johnson was president after Kennedy. He became president when Kennedy was murdered. And Lyndon Johnson said, trust is when you have them by the balls. 
That was his understanding of political power. Uh, and, and, and that has turned out to be true, whether it's in cyberspace or meat space. So we were going to get information and disseminate it in a safe, secure way, or so we thought, on behalf of justice, freedom, and ultimately peace in the world. So how did that work out? How did WikiLeaks work out? WikiLeaks, when it came into being, was going to be a harbinger of objective distribution of hidden information on behalf of openness and transparency. It was not going to be a partisan player in geopolitical politics that were inevitably going to get pushback from whichever side you adhered to from the other side. So Julian Assange was thought by many, and still is by some, to be a great hero on behalf of that process. But where is Julian now? He has just moved from one cell to another cell. And after that, he's going to go to another cell. Why do they do that? Because information does not want to be free. Information wants to be used in whatever way the people who have the information can use it on behalf of what it is they intend to do. And that means the technology you have created is dual use. And anything good that can be done with it can be reversed. And the reverse is always anything bad can be done with it. So should we be surprised? When Perry Barlow said this was a separate world and people believed that cyberspace was a whole domain of existential reality separate from anything we had experienced before, uh, they were overlooking something. Uh, they were overlooking that who, who had created the Internet. Uh, it came out of ARPANET. ARPANET became DARPA. Uh, ARPA became DARPA, the Advanced Research Project, Military, Corporate, Academic. You know that it was created by a small group of military, corporate, and academic people for the easy and free exchange of information among people who in meat space already trusted one another. And security was one of the lowest priorities, if at all a priority, because they wanted openness and freedom of access. And as a result, when it suddenly exploded and ported to a domain on which all business, all government transactions so much was done without security, we have created a kind of abyss into which we stare every time we go on the Internet, of which the presentations at this conference and other conferences all over the world are primary examples. In other words, it's full of holes, it is Swiss cheese, and it is never going to be fixed. I shaved this morning with a razor, and the razor had a blade, and the people who put their money into making good blades do not put their money into the kind of genetic engineering that would enable me to tweak my hair growth so that I never need a razor. They want me to buy razor after razor after razor after razor. In a secure world, all of the fixes we try to do to the Internet, to all of the nets, to make them viable for trusted communication are subject to the same reality. Uh, we don't want to fix it because it has grown into a multi-billion dollar business. And that's why we all here in this space can have day jobs. So we shouldn't be surprised because ARPANET was the or originator of it. Uh, we thought it was about free speech. But free speech, I've noticed over my long life, is valued only so long as it does not become actionable. Uh, you know who Martin Luther King Jr. was, I trust, in the United States. If he had stayed in the pulpit of his church in Atlanta, Georgia, and just preached, and Sunday in and Sunday out people came and said what a wonderful preacher he was, he wouldn't have been shot. But when he chose to move people to action, when free speech became actionable, he became a threat. Someone who was more cynical than I said, if voting mattered, they wouldn't let us do it. That was a rock star. Martin Luther King Jr., no need to shoot if he's just talking. No need to shoot me, I just talk. I don't do anything dangerous. So what happens if you become a threat? 
Well, what happened to Gandhi? What happened to Jesus? What happened to Nelson Mandela? And now journalists uh, of all sorts are... That's not supposed to be there. Uh, journalists of all sorts are killed. So what was it we created when we built this Internet? I have a short story, and here's one I really will pop up, uh, that's in this collection of short stories, Mind Games. Uh, it's called Zero Day Roswell. And in that short story, the aliens have come and crashed their spacecraft in Roswell so that we will discover the technology with which to build the Internet. And why did they do that? Because they are bored going to cocktail parties in Georgetown in Washington and doing intelligence the old way. They wanted us to build the Internet so we could put everything about the human psyche onto it and then instead of having to work hard to discover who we were, all they had to do is download the gestalt, the whole. And the story is told by a professional intelligence agent who's on his deathbed. And he said, when you uh, do a denial of service attack or deface an enemy website, we have to go in and put, put it back up. Well, what do I mean? I mean, back in the day when Al-Qaeda was the threat and ISIS wasn't, I was talking to a senior person at the NSA and I said, this is interesting, isn't it? Uh, Well-intentioned hacktivist vigilantes keep attacking Al-Qaeda websites and bringing them down, and they're so resilient, they pop back up. And I looked at him with a querying smile, and he knew what I was asking, and he said, okay, those guys don't know how to write code. So we have to go in when well-intentioned vigilantes bring down their websites rewrite the code, put in defenses, and put them back up in a more robust way because it's much more valuable to the intelligence agencies to see, for example, where the antelope go to drink water and then where they go after they drink water. They want the websites up so they can do tracking of the people who go to them and see who they, who they talk to because that's how you build a map of the network you're uh, contending with. So... What looks like well-intended people doing something that was a well-intended thing uh, didn't work. My agent goes on to say, half the attractive outfits, uh, attractions out there, the most attractive of them, we made. We have partnered with the beginning from the big, uh, with the big guys. For, for example, Cisco. Uh, shouldn't have been a surprise to anyone who wasn't starry-eyed to know that every time Cisco shipped routers, they were taken aside for a brief interruption while back doors were inserted in them and they were put back in the mail when people wanted the destination address to have that enhanced router so that people uh, could get in. We built remote access into the chips. We worked with Microsoft, Oracle, Apple, you name it, from the very beginning. Uh, I could say all this and more uh, because I was writing fiction. Why did I start writing fiction? Because I was working with people after 9-11, mostly NSA, some CIA, some independents, who were very concerned about what happened to the intelligence agencies and what it brought forth into the world for America and the world. And this is what happened. The director received an order from the Bush White House called Executive Order 12333, and it said, gather up everything. Gather up everything. Because if you're trying to protect the entire interface of the world, as a friend said, my job is simple. Protect the entire Internet. That's all I have to do from attackers who need to find only one, one way in. Protect the entire Internet. And so <laughs> when you're trying to protect the entire Internet, you discover very quickly uh, that you can't. Uh, and the NSA challenge... The NSA challenge, according to a friend at CIA who said this recently, is, quote, the challenge is how to destroy freedom in order to save it. Those of you who, who know the history of Vietnam know that, we, we, that there was a fair, famous saying after a village was entirely obliterated uh, during the war, we had to destroy the village in order to save it. Well, I was working with these people to try to find an ethical framework to which I'll return in a minute too, uh, for how to do ethics in a world that has been transformed, transformed by the technology from the inside out. And we had discussions for about two years 
over that problem and, and made up a paper that went into the NSA, into the agency, uh, as suggestive guidelines for how you might think about the problems you're going to encounter uh, in, in this world. And a senior uh, assistant deputy director said to me in the middle of one of those conversations, you know, Richard, you can't ever discuss what we talk about in here. You know that, right? And I said, well, yeah. He said, well, unless you start writing fiction. He said, fiction is the only way you can tell the truth now. And so since he gave me that trigger, I've published 35 short stories, a novel, and I'm working on a new one, as I said, called Mobius. I am encouraging you to look at what is real. Look with a beginner's eyes, not assimilated into the Perry Barlow-like myth of what this is. Hackerdom is a magnificent play space, but whether intentional or not, as I suggested in that short story in a joking way, it is an observational space. It is a honeypot. A honeypot for human behavior in which everything about us is rendered visible. And you know that. And in my speech, which is online, a lot of them are on YouTube, called When Privacy Goes Poof, Why It's Gone and Never Coming Back, I make the point that the individual who had privacy from the 1700s on is no longer the social construction of our reality. Because other people know more about us than we know about ourselves. And therefore, when we operate from the inside out, as if we know what we are doing and why we are doing it, and all of the actions we can take are parsed and managed and observed, and then through AI and uh, data processing, discovered to reveal patterns of behavior, belief, uh, everything. Uh, then we are known by others much more than we know ourselves, and the electronic world we've created has become a means of observation, surveillance, and ultimately, more important, prediction and control. So Facebook says they're going to deal with privacy by making, it, making your posts less available to all your friends and now only available to certain groups, and they conveniently ignore the major concern with privacy is that they will continue to gather up all the information because that's the money shot for them. Uh, our information sold to whoever wants it. So I'm trying to suggest that what we have done is uh, create a technology that transformed the world. Uh, Langdon Winner, who's a brilliant philosopher of technology, said engineering behavior through technologies of communication have created emergent properties of ubiquitous connectivity that have shaped social, political, economic, and cultural habits. So... Individuals unconsciously engage with this space and don't recognize or realize what it enables other people to know about us. Uh, just this week, I noticed a uh, uh, AI can be used to predict when you or anyone else is likely to quit your job within six months. Now, you may have an inkling of it, but the people who are using AI to determine by the pattern of your behavior that that's what's so can then intervene in order to call you in and ask if you're having any issues or you're having any problems. Is there something we need to discuss? And they can begin making strategies and plans that are based on their more superior knowledge of what it is you intend to do in the future. And that's just one example. Let me go back some years ago and tell you what we knew then. Dr. Pentland, the director of MIT's Human Dynamics Lab, said, we have a God's eye view of all human behavior. Your phones, he said, it was a big deal then, your phones can know. And when they analyzed 16 million records of call date, time, position, they could determine that people's movements followed mathematical patterns, and with enough information, they could forecast their future whereabouts with 94% accuracy. For us, he said, people like look like little particles that move in space and occasionally communicate with each other. We are turning society into a laboratory, a honeypot, I say, where behavior can be objectively followed. It is not just about observing what is happening. It is about shaping what is happening. These patterns allow us better to learn how to manipulate trends, people, opinions, and mass psychology. So it's not that propaganda, manipulation, and control are new things on the face of the earth. It's that they have arrived at a level of abstraction, and the power is in the hands of fewer and fewer people who know how to do that. And as you know, 
when you give them information about yourself, uh, that's what you're, you're giving them. So we expected the intelligence community to be one of the hallmarks of this new world, and it is, but not in the way we expected. Um, there was a conversation in the office of the director of the NSA in which the liaison with the Brits said, we need to take special care of the Brits. Some of you who work with intelligence here in the Netherlands know that you sometimes have felt that same way too, that you have a special relationship and there are instances in which you have acted as if we did. And he said, we need to take care of our special friends. And the deputy director of SIGINT, or Signals Intelligence, interrupted him to say, I'm sorry, we have no friends. We have no allies. We only have targets. And the intelligence community, as you know, was set up so that it could operate in all of the countries of the world, yours, Israelis, Russians, Chinese, Americans, everybody, so they could operate in the other countries of the world as if they could disregard the laws of those countries. And I'm making the point that after 9-11, that slippery slope went inside America as well. Because now the laws, as they had been understood prior to the technical revolution, did not apply in the same way. I gave a speech at the end of the Kennedy, uh, the Clinton administration to the senior lawyers at the Department of Treasury in Washington about what it meant for their work when precedent on which they based their reasoning and case, case studies uh, no longer held true because that transformational engine had created a different society. And it is very, very difficult for us to grasp what it means that we have created something that's profoundly different from what came before in the same way that the printing press transformed the world in which it emerged and created the possibility for the scientific revolution, for democracies, for political revolution, and for things never, ever again to be the same. Pardon me? Oh, thanks. Good to have friends, right? All right, we'll stick with that for a while. Um, it's very cheap, the book. It's on Kindle, you know. Uh, I, I think I got a royalty last month for $6.32 from the sale of uh, probably one. <laughs> uh, I just throw that out there as a subtle reminder that they are available. So... What is it you're protecting? Cybersecurity incidents and the risks that result therefrom affect the company's financial statements. Economics is the right hand of God. It's the money that matters. When you talk about privacy, you give lip service to protecting privacy and transparency. But what you really operate on is how much is it going to cost us? What's going to happen when there's a breach? The vast majority of successful attacks today are using known vulnerabilities in well-known software that have been patched already by software vendors. So most of them can be stopped by just knowing in your thousands of machines what you have out there and making sure it's patched. But you know about one third of the IT estates of the biggest organizations, the CIO's team doesn't know what hardware is out there or what software is running on it. So how are you gonna patch that? The quote uh, from one of them is, I don't know those machines exist, or the software running on those machines exists. The majority of businesses in the U.S. and U.K. leave doors wide open to attacks that can potentially stop business operations for hours and at the worst, wipe out billions of dollars from the value of a company. According to J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon, cyber risk is the biggest risk the financial system faces. Okay? So, what have we created? Uh, what, what I said a long time ago when I wrote a piece for an intelligence journal, information security is one task, both offensive and defensive in the intelligence community, sanctions breaking foreign laws while prohibiting similar activities on American soil, but simple distinctions of domestic and foreign no longer hold. The CIA was built to operate Outside of America, the FBI was built to operate inside. Now the FBI is in the world. CIA is inside the United States. Because the boundaries have gone down and the ability to distinguish foreign and domestic no longer exist in the same way. 
So the convergence of enabling technologies of intrusion, interception, and panoptic reach, combined with a sense of urgency about a counter-terror imperative and a mandate from our leaders to do everything possible to defeat an amorphous non-state entity defined by behaviors rather than boundaries, borders, or even a clear ideological allegiance, has created an ominous but invisible and seemingly inevitable set of conditions that undermine all of the previous cornerstones of law, ethics, and even our religious traditions. Because religions, too, are going through the looking glass of transformation. This is a country with both Catholics and foundational Protestant denominations, and the Protestant denominations would not exist had the printing press not generated the possibility to create new identities and then have them multiply almost cone-like except for subtle distinctions uh, from one to the other. And we are going through the same kind of transformational looking glass for our religions and our politics. And it's one of the reasons why political discourse in the United States is mired in a 20th century framework of the world, not in the 21st century, because we are trying to talk as if nation states still hold the absolute un contested power in the world rather than transnational non-state enemies where the alliances mix and match in the trenches. And every time I've talked to people in the intelligence community, they know this is what they're up against. It's what kind of deals can you make now with who on behalf of the momentary intention and goal of your process or program. Because they know the primary goal of security and intelligence work is to tell people in the world that when they go to sleep tonight, they will wake up in a world that is pretty much the same. It is to comfort and assuage the burdens and cares, anxieties and fears of people who have trouble grasping what it is that I'm talking about and whose cognitive dissonance as a result uh, raises itself higher and higher. But as Nietzsche said, in the face of the unknown, which confronts us with fear and anxiety, the first explanation that makes any sense to people, regardless of its accuracy, is what people will grasp if it comforts them and makes them feel better and alleviates their cognitive anxiety. So, stability, the persistence of structures even while they're changing, the continuity of identities even while they're changing, all this work has evolved and we are having profound disruptions as a result, and it is difficult to talk about it in a realistic way, even in a small way. Uh, hackers, you're hackers in the best sense of the word, and they created a dichotomy, uh, not a dichotomy, a hierarchy of black hat, gray hat, and white hat hackers. And I took a look at who were really in each one of those categories, and I realized that a black hat hacker was what we call a hacker. And a gray hat hacker, was a hacker who put the truth down somewhere, but knows very well where he put it. And a white hat hacker is a hacker who puts the truth down somewhere and then forgot where he put it. Hackers. It's all about the tools and techniques that enable you to penetrate these complex systems which are wide open and invitations for penetration. And it raises the, the, <laughs> the uh, question of ethics. Well, what does ethics look like? There are real Dutch heroes. Does the name Freddy Overstigen mean anything to anybody? Freddy Overstigen. Okay. At 14, she became an assassin and saboteur against the Nazis here in her home native Netherlands. Germany had invaded. She'd been recruited by the local Dutch resistance commander in Harlem. He said, what you have to do is learn to shoot Nazis. I remember my sister saying, she said, well, that's something I've never done. The sisters, along with a woman named Hani Schaft, became a female underground squad, part of a cell of seven that killed collaborators and occupying Nazi troops. They staged drive-by shootings from bicycles. They lured German soldiers into the woods where they killed them. And Freddie died at 93, and her death was announced by the Hani Schaft Foundation, named after that third young girl, which had been started in their memory because Schaft had been captured, tortured, and executed by the Nazis 18 days before the liberation of the Netherlands at the age of 24. Why am I bringing her up? I was hoping, I have to admit, hoping against hope, with the absence of historical relevance everywhere in the world today, that you knew your own heroes 
Because what is the value of your heroes? But what the religious people call am- anamnesis, the memory captured and brought forth into the present with such vividness and power and palpability that it lives again. That those memories, those saints, uh, the hagiography, the story of your personal saints in technology, in the Netherlands, for your history, must be captured as examples In her case, she died at 93, but in the case of the other one, she was tortured to death as a young girl. Count the cost. And so, if you can, if you contend with the powers that be that have created this world, uh, you you know what happens to whistleblowers. Uh, How many of you have seen, here's one, I I bet I'll get more hands. Game of Thrones? Okay, a few more. Game of Thrones. So what do they do when they cut off somebody's head, like Ned Stark? You put it on the gate. And then everyone who comes into that gate knows what happens to whistleblowers. There's a law firm in uh, Washington, D.C. that handles whistleblowers, and they, they say uh, there's only one thing that will get you through the courageous articulation of the truth when you find yourself in a dicey situation and feel compelled to tell the truth, and that is a conscience that will not ever quit. If you are motivated by money, revenge, anger, any other lesser lesser good, you will cave because of what the powers that be do to whistleblowers. You count the cost, and you evaluate whether or not if your values are those of a hacktivist or a vigilante or a real hacker. Uh, you evaluate what it is you can do and how you can build trusted networks of people committed to values that have, while they're changing, have nevertheless been the mainstay of the human soul, the mainstay of what it means to be locked into our humanity, instead of just being expedient in going along to get along. The cost is significant. The last talks I've done at DEF CON, I've spoken at DEF CON now, last, so, last summer was the 23rd straight year. The first year, there were 375. Last year, there were 40,000. It's a big change, and I have grown grown with that conference. And the talks I gave last year and the year before were about what it can do to you in the intelligence community, what it can do to you doing professional intelligence work, and what security work can do to you if you are not mindful and vigilant because of the ethical dilemmas in which you may find yourself entangled if, in fact, you have the courage to persist in those situations and allow those ethical entanglements to ripen and become true in your life. So what you do with that will be different depending on what it is, well, who it is you are and what you can tolerate in terms of what it is that you have to do. Let me give you an example. A friend, when I was putting these talks together, over 70 people at CIA, NSA, military and corporate sent me their stories, and this one is one of the most poignant. He was a senior scientist at CIA for almost 20 years. He was very clever, and he took a toxin from the leafcutter ant, and a, or a toxin from a butterfly, and a fungus from a leafcutter ant, and a couple of other chemicals that are best left unnamed, and he developed a procedure for destroying the coca crop in South America. The coca crop, of course, is the origin of cocaine. And if he destroyed the crop, then cocaine was going to stop flowing into the United States. And he went to a country in South America and tested it undercover, and it worked beautifully. It eliminated the coca crop, and he came back to get permission. And they said, well, maybe you better not do that, because that sounds like uh, biological warfare, and we can't do that. So he showed them why it did not meet the rubric or strictures for biological warfare. And they said, well, you, you might destroy the, uh, all the banana crops. And he showed them that they had tested it and it didn't destroy anything. No matter what he said, they said, no, maybe, maybe this, maybe that. And finally he said, it works. I've tested it. Why can't I do it? And they said, just forget it. And he said, no. And they said, yes, forget it. Way too many people make way too much money from cocaine in the government for them to tolerate their cash flow being interrupted. And he said, let's be whistleblowers then. Let's expose this nefarious activity. And the answer that came back to him from his liaison to the executive branch was, I don't think you understand what we're trying to tell you. 
shut up and go away, or you are going to be killed. Okay, so he left the CIA after 17 years. He was shattered in his moral authority within himself because he thought he had the courage to do the right thing. You go into this work, you go into security, you go into intelligence, because we are good guys or gals doing good guy stuff. And then when you come back from a mission where you find that might not be entirely true, as someone at CIA said, I have to go back to the trough for another ladle of patriotism uh, to try to boost yourself up to believing that myth again. And yet, once the myth is unraveled, the myth is unraveled forever. So what did he do? He left CIA because he was ashamed of himself for not having the courage, even though that threat was viable, to to contend with what he thought was the wrong thing. I don't have time to tell you several other stories that other people have come up and told me that corroborated that story. Uh, this is not fanciful stuff. This is not Hollywood stuff. But Hollywood stuff is important here because movies and films are how people get ideas into the mind of society. I had producers and directors say that. They said, look, you want to get something in, just like my friend who said, start writing fiction. Uh, this is the candy that makes it all go down easily and changes people's minds. So what kind of movies are big out there? Avenger, Endgame, just made $2 billion. Why? Because it's a comic book. Comic books and cartoons, excuse me, full-length animated features, we used to call them cartoons, are all over the multiplex. Why? Go back to those books that I mentioned in the first place, like Neuromancer by William Gibson or Snow Crash. They were all loner hacker heroes. And the purpose of narratives in which loner hacker heroes, or the Stieg Larsson novels out of Sweden, in which loner hacker heroes can in fact take on the man and win is a fiction. But it is a fiction that sustains and supports our self-identity because we want to believe that as lone hacker heroes, we too can do that. So that we can, as Julian Assange said once, we're going to crush the bastards. Well, you learn in the gray world that we all inhabit that the bastards are everywhere and they can include you. And so things are not black and white. They are all gray, and we have created an extraordinary edifice that is never going to be taken down as long as it generates as much money as it does. So what happens to other people? The chief scientist of the NSA, when I was talking to him at a conference, suddenly disclosed the truth of his life and began sobbing, and I held him as he sobbed because 11 people had died as a result of a mission for which he had done the intelligence background. And he was terrified that he had not done enough, that there was something he had left undone. This work can get to you when you find out that someone you've recruited, as someone at NSA did, and find out that they've been outed by some mole in our own agency and captured and tortured and killed. Well, in that case, that individual just started drinking heavily and had to be removed from his work with clearances until it was clear that he could get back on the wagon and do the work. And that was the only concern they had at the agency. Is he capable of doing the work? Not what does it do to him? So when somebody at CIA told me, I carry 24 suicides on my mind, and the latest have been senior people at CIA who could not live with what they knew, a friend at NSA wrote not long ago, he said, we got an email saying, watch each other. And he thought, what the hell is that about? So he investigated and found out there were three suicides that week. And when I spoke to a recently retired deputy director of NSA, I said, I hear you had three suicides this week. He said, no, we didn't. We had six. I'm trying to say the stakes are very high, that you may find it an easier glide to find a niche in the industry that doesn't confront you with these realities, but it's quite possible that you may indeed find yourself confronted, and it's important for you to have some idea of what to do when you do. We've been in this for a long time. People forget Marshall McLuhan. You know that name, Marshall McLuhan? Okay, one. I feel like Rip Van Winkle. 
Honestly, I, I went to sleep and I've awakened in the 21st century. And my points of reference is like when I go to the gym and they put on the music and I say, can you put on some music? And they say, oh no, that's music. And I said, no, no, no. No, those are people who can't sing. They're shouting. They're screaming. It's grunge. It's not music. And then I remember my mother saying, oh God, Elvis Presley, the Beatles, you don't know Cole Porter. <laughs> Uh, so it goes from generation to generation. McLuhan said in 1970, World War III is a guerrilla war, information war, with no division between military and civilian populations. Blowback is the unintended feedback loops and consequences that come when we forget that the individuals on whose behalf we are doing the work is also the enemy. In fact, because operations aimed at the enemy blow back and affect the people here as well. Well, that's a whole, I just almost segued into a whole other talk, but uh, since this one is supposed to be winding down, I'm not going to do that. Uh, just face the reality of what you're doing. Here's a really good hacker who said to me, even when we do our jobs right, we're going to get owned. The real challenge is getting business leaders to accept that reality and allow us to redirect funding to programs that help companies deal with that. Another said the problem is to tell the truth, you have to, one, not be a vendor because vendors are selling solutions to problems they can identify, not to the problems they can't. And they can't always sell what it is they want to sell, which is the ability to protect your enterprise even though that may be claimed. They can do all kinds of things, but they can't give a total solution to protecting your enterprise. He said, not be a vendor and be willing to spill the beans on getting owned. He said, if we're going to tell the truth, you have to stand up and say, I work security. My job is to prevent intrusions. We get owned a lot, so I kind of fail at my job. And sometimes it's really bad. And here's how we deal with it. In other words, you start with seeing the world as it is with beginner's eyes, with the clarity shorn of the mythologies that once captured this domain and made it seem innocent and serene. It is not. And you are going to find yourselves at crossroads. And what is it that works? According to the people I've talked to in all of these domains to which I have referred, you need trusted friends. You can't do this alone. You need trusted friends. And for the ethical dilemmas, there has to be one or two or three people with whom you can think through what it is that challenges you, when it challenges you. If it doesn't challenge you, fine. Just do the job and sail on. But you have to have friends, and when you encounter these traumatic events, you have to know how to come back from them. Uh, Steve Miles was a medical ethicist at the University of Minnesota, where I live now. And he became alarmed at how many doctors seemed to be moving from torture to torture to torture when we began doing torture again. It wasn't enhanced interrogation. We were torturing people, and sometimes they died. A friend calls them, oops, deaths. You're working on somebody, and oops. And then you call in a doctor to falsify the death certificate and say he died of natural causes rather than the nefarious things that were being done to him. So Steve noticed that there were a lot of doctors there, and he got the material from the Freedom of Information Act, thousands of documents, all uncorrelated, and he connected the dots, who was where, when, and discovered that we were doing what we had con insisted at Nuremberg was no longer to be done in the face of human rights that needed to be acknowledged and honored. Doctors were moving from torture to torture and learning as they did, and this is medical experimentation on behalf of uh, torture and he wrote a book called Oath Betrayed. Well, I went to the AMA, the American Medical Association, and talked to the head ethicist there and said, what are you doing about this that Steve has uh, illuminated so brilliantly? And he said, that's not our problem. Let Steve go organize people if he thinks it's a problem. Every avenue we tried, the powers that be were uninterested in following out the obvious implications of that. But what did it do to Steve? He, as me, experienced secondary trauma from engaging with people who were traumatized. And it changed him. He would wake up sweating from nightmares, he said. Uh, he, he had to learn, he said, to accentuate the beautiful in life, to find beauty, and to put himself in those places 
where he could live with the scars that he had as a mark of his humanity. I'm not suggesting an innocent path through all this thicket. I am suggesting that you need to ameliorate some of the possibilities that could happen to you in this industry if you're not wary, mindful, and vigilant. This is what you get. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I always have so much more that I can say, but I won't. I'll just say that you need mutuality, you need accountability, and you need feedback. And those are the hallmarks of any individual or organization that works. The mutuality means don't do it alone. Find someone you can trust to talk through the sticky wickets. Get the feedback you need through frequent feedback loops into and out of the systems in which you work. And ask yourself where your limits are. We all are compromising, as Jeff Moss illustrated in those decade-long uh, informational trajectories, uh, from not working for the man to working for the man to being the man. That's just what growing up can involve. But there can be ethical dilemmas that confront you with soul-searing moral harms. And that's all I'm encouraging you to do is recognize that that's a possibility. Stare into the abyss and do not allow it to stare back into your own soul. There are ameliorating possibilities. And at this point, I will say, does anybody have a question? All right, let me change that then. Anybody got a question? Question you back there? No. No. Nope. Uh, I, I want to thank you very much for your presentation. And then my question was indeed, if there are any questions. Yes. Oh. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I am old and long in tooth. And if we walk into, it's only four minutes from here, Dylan said. Yes. If we walk into the party... And it is so loud with head banging music because that's what young people like. Um, then not for long. <laughs> but if it's a melodic, you know, a Moon River, Andy Williams, uh, something like that, uh, we may, we may stop in. I, I don't know. But I am available, you know, through Twitter and online and email and messaging and messenger and, um, on and on and LinkedIn and Facebook. Take a card. It has all the information you'll need. And uh, I do make myself available uh, for anybody who, as a result of any of the conversations like this that we have, wants to follow up when something does occur to them, when a conversation would be helpful. Uh, I'm, I'm around. Uh, so it may not be at the party, but it's available through all these electronic means. And uh, as a friend at NSA said when I was going to call him about some dicey thing, uh, he said, use a wire line. It'll take him about three or four seconds longer. <laughs> right? So be aware that we live inside a panoptic space. Uh, and, and we are very careful in how we conduct these conversations. Okay? Thank you. Uh, uh, quest yeah. Question? Yeah, it's a, it's an extremely small group of people that are controlling the press now. Um, and they're talking with another small group of people who are controlling the governments. So you mentioned, uh, some young people from here with the woman who died age 24 and the woman whose uh, colleague who died 93 and nobody seemed to know about her. Um, is there any way of us hanging together, protecting each other? and avoiding what might come from those people in charge? Or are we just, you know, in the meat chopper already? Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's it. That's the question. And uh, it's, it doesn't have an easy answer. Uh, before WikiLeaks, someone I knew here said, um, didn't have a name yet, he said, it's not working to do the hacktivism we've been doing. We're going to have to be a little more active. We're going to have to go get some stuff. Uh, and he wanted to tell me that, and he wanted to tell me what was coming. Now, I'm coming to Amsterdam. This is what he said. I'll meet you at the 
uh, Central Station, ride with you down to The Hague or the Rotterdam, wherever I was doing a speech then. Uh, and then we got off the train and we walked around in a crowd where no one could overhear us. And he told me what was coming and then he got back on the train. He felt that that kind of activity was necessary. Uh, or the fellow at DEF CON, who I knew well. Um, and we used to talk about his work. It was very sexy, very cool work. But then he connected with NSA. He said, I signed the agreement. I can't talk to you anymore. And I said, okay, that's fine. And about six years later at DEF CON, he said, I've got to talk to you. So we, he insisted we leave the conference, walk down the strip in Vegas with his hordes of people, sit on the steps of a mall with people streaming by so he wouldn't be overheard. And he said, are you familiar with the particularly named a terrorist incident? I said, sure. He said, what do you think happened? I told him what I thought happened. Uh, he said, that's not what happened. I said, what happened? He said, he told me what happened. I was stunned. I s Why was I stunned? Because he had pulled the cornerstone out from under my construction of reality. And what he told me said to me that I thought I was smart enough to know what was going on. I didn't have any idea. And that called into question everything I thought. And I said, how do you know this? And he said, because I did it. And if you tell anybody that I told you, or put it in one of your short stories, because fiction is blah, 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 I could be killed. But I had to get it off my chest. So now I'm carrying it, right? He understood that that method of communication was the only one we could trust. And he trusted me, it may be obvious, or you know from my history, that I was an Episcopal clergyman, a priest, for 16 years. And that has been the basis of a lot of the relationships I've had with these people. And they trust me to hold in confidence what I am told. And there are consequences for me of that in, in my work, but nothing dire. And I stick with fiction, but I also hold these confidences and help people once in a while uh, be able to do the right thing without, without suffering for it. Uh, small, very, very, very small, with very little impact. Uh, because look at China. Look at the massive control system and the authoritarian governments that here in Europe are gaining more and more and more power. And look at the idiocy we have going on in the United States. No one, no one in their right mind dreamed that a third or a fourth of the American people or half could entertain. The, 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 we couldn't grasp the willingness to enter a cult a cultic reality where you can ignore the reality of what's in front of your own eyes. I mean, so this is, these are serious questions and it's a, their world. So in the case of the one I brought up from Netherlands, you were occupied. Um, some chose one way to go and some chose another. That was not easy. And you had to ultimately forgive people who, who chose expediency and to live rather than to risk being killed. So the cost for the one was to be tortured to death, but for the other, she accomplished what she could. And I am old enough to know that what we think we can accomplish when we're young is not anywhere near what we wind up looking back and saying, what was all that about? And yet, if you don't do what you can do, uh, it was a rabbi who said, you know, if, uh, if you're not for yourself, uh, who will be? But if you're only for yourself, what are you? And if not now, when? So it is identifying in the flesh those on whom you can reasonably expect to trust the account when you, I mean, one, the person I, m I mentioned said, God, I have a friend. So this is the deputy director of, of the NSA who was in a program that he questioned. The people I've talked to at CIA, they find themselves heading programs that one called up. He said, this is the apocalypse. He was an evangelical Christian. He said, this is the end times if I do this. And he said, what should I do? And as a clergyman, you learn you can't tell somebody else what to do. We could talk it through, and we did for a full hour. And he said, I'm not sure what to do. I said, you know what to do. And he said, sometimes knowing what to do is much harder than doing it when you once, once you know what it is. Uh, the doing is easier than struggling through those very thorny thickets to determine wh where are your limits? What am I capable of doing? Can I live with myself if I don't? Uh, so we find ways to trust other people. For me, it helps that I go all around the world and have developed a trusted network with whom I can have quiet conversations. And there are people I've, honest to God, love. I love them. 
And ultimately, love is what redeems us. Because the alternatives are all lesser than that. So you, you, you try to find out what is your highest value? What does love look like mm -hmm. for you? And how do I live out of that? Mm -hmm. And how do I build a structure, a system that has mutuality with the right people, sufficient feedback so I don't go off? And that's what my friend at NSA said. He said, without their feedback, I would not have been able to work my way through to how to protect the American people from intrusion and surveillance. At the same time, we had to implement some of these very, very difficult programs. So he didn't quit the agency. He's a hero. But he did what he could to determine how to protect the American people the best way possible. And, and the successes are always partial. They're, they're never complete. And I wish I had a better, better answer. Uh, I, I, I don't. But you know what it means to love somebody. You've loved and you've been loved. And you know in those contexts what it is that you're called forth to do sometimes by circumstances. And that is the template to which we have to refer when we're in those more difficult spots. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for your question. Uh, please give a warm round of applause. Yeah. Thank you.